every page of the book. Uh, because nothing changed this country more profoundly in my life right, than that war. And uh, after, after so many years, when we uh, invaded Iraq, uh, the veterans who fought in that war and, and protesters who fought against the war, it had, it had a profound effect. Uh, here we go again, uh, another quagmire. What, what, what have we learned? And that's what, what started, you know, my head spinning about uh, getting these characters together again uh, and, and, and uh, maybe link uh, their experience to the current experience in Iraq. And that's why we have that young, young man in Washington as part of this. And that was uh, basically the, uh, the emotional and the art artistic reason. But I had the, uh, the exec producer, Tom Wright, had been bugging me for uh, a couple of years. We both lived in Seattle at the time. And he would, he would, uh, he would uh, enact scenes from the last detail. I said, you've got you to bring these guys back again. And I reminded him, I said, I can't. You know, the last detail is a tragedy. You don't have a sequel to a tragedy. Uh, but the more he pressed and the, the more I thought about it, I, I thought it really, it really should have a sequel, but I, I didn't want to do it as a film at that time. I wanted to do it uh, as a novel. Uh, the weird thing that happened is that the, the film uh, influenced the novel. Because that character, the, the Billy Badass character played by Jack Nicholson in the book is a kind of closet intellectual who uh, is in the Navy, a lifer in the Navy, because the, the Navy is very clearly defined for him. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and that's an appeal. And, and, and the detail just threw that out the window. What was well defined as a man's role in the world is thrown out. Uh, so um, anyhow, he, he kept bugging me to do it. And I, I, I did it as a, a novel. And I said, okay, if we, now let's see if we can make this into a film. And we, we had to go to Sony. Uh, they, they had right of uh, first refusal uh, because uh, Columbia had done the original. And they passed on it, and, and Paramount picked it up and said they would love to do it. And at that point, uh, I kind of became a, uh, an ad hoc producer with Tom Wright, and we decided to go to Alexander Payne to direct it because Payne had worked with uh, Nicholson successfully. And Payne liked the idea, but he said, I'm not going to put my career on the line at the whim of Jack Nicholson. <laughs> and uh, and at, uh, at that point, oh, I, I think prior to that point, uh, we had contacted Harry Giddis, who, who, who died before the picture was released, unfortunately. Harry Giddis became a co-producer because he was a close friend of Jack Nicholson. And he said he would try to, uh, you know, uh, uh, lubricate the way to, to Nicholson. And Randy Quaid was over the moon. He wanted to do it in the worst possible way. And uh, the, the other character from the original, Otis Young, uh, had died. He was, uh, he, he had left Hollywood and uh, acting to become a minister. And then uh, shortly afterwards died. And that's why the character in Last Black Flying is a minister. And uh, when, when we were dealing with Jack and Randy Quaid, Morgan Freeman stepped in and said, yes, he'd love to do it. Uh, and then everything just kind of fell apart. <laughs> uh, because uh, without getting into all the details, it just, it, it, we weren't able to put it together. And so I thought, well, that's probably that. Uh, OK, on to the next thing. And, uh, uh, I have to back up now because one of the things Harry Giddis did was suggest Rick Linkletter. We thought that's a great idea. Uh, Tom and I, we both love Link Linkletter. And Linkletter came on and said, yeah, I'd love to do it. So when it all fell apart, uh, he said to me, you know, there's no reason why we can't do this anyway. Uh, we, we can't recast it and do it as a sequel. That, that wouldn't work. But uh, I don't see why this couldn't stand alone. Uh, just just uh, let's change the, uh, the names, let's change the defining event, 
uh, let's see if we can make this a standalone. And, and I said, great. So at that point, it became a uh, spec script. And uh, he went off and did uh, Boyhood and uh, a couple of other things that he was doing. And I went off and I wrote four novels under the name Ann Argula. And then I got a phone, and we kept in touch. Uh, uh, when we had, the, the whole collaboration was done electronically. I didn't meet Rick until rehearsals. Uh, but we kept in, in touch uh, by phone, and, and he called me up one day and said, I told you this day would come. He said, Amazon asked me if there's a script I've always wanted to do and couldn't do. And so I said, yeah. And so we're, we're off. And that's how all of that happened. That's amazing. How many of you had seen The Last Detail? And amazes, conversely, me. Yeah. <laughs> how many of you had not? Just so we, oh, wow, okay. All right. So, okay, so now we're off, and, and having heard who the cast might have been back in the day, like suddenly my, the wheels in my head are going round and round and round, because um, Randy Quaid's crazy. But um, <laughs> that, may have been, that may have been the deciding factor. <laughs> Because, uh, and, and again, this, I, boy, I, I wouldn't mind writing a movie about that guy. Uh, really, just, just about Randy, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah because uh, at one point he said, you know, uh, I own the rights to the, that character. And I said, beg your pardon? He said, uh, I think that's natural law. I created the character. I did this portrait. That, that character is me. And uh, then he said, uh, and, and all I want is, uh, is whatever Jack gets. Uh, the same size trailer and, and, and same money, and uh, of course Morgan Freeman would, would want the same, and that, that just art, you know. We, we, we made the movie for less than Nicholson would have got the star. So let's move into the cast you do have, and yeah. and specifically, I would I would love to hear from your the writer's side of your perspective, which maybe is your whole perspective, but um, how they embody the ca the characters for you. Emotionally and practically. How? How? I'm sorry. How the the cast we have now, the 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 cast that did the film, embody your characters as you originally conceived them? Uh, uh, well, they're very close. They're very close to the characters in the book. Uh, <coughs> you know, the movie the movie begins and ends as it, as the book begins and ends, and the. Uh, the, uh, the the characters themselves are are, are, are very very close and uh, initially Linkler gave me a list of five uh, including uh, Brian Cranston for for that role and uh, I liked all the actors he had but I thought the only one that was right and, and brought the uh, the energy and and the chameleon like quality was uh, was uh, Cranston. And um, uh, shortly after that, uh, Rick just called me up and said, I've got Steve Carell to play Doc. I said, Jesus, that's inspired. I, uh, I, I would never have imagined casting him. And, uh, and Lawrence Fishburne just seemed to be a slam dunk. And the kid, who I, 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 I just love this kid, uh, his name is Quentin Johnson, who plays uh, Washington. Uh, he was a discovery that uh, Rick made at the University of Texas in Austin and put him in a, one of his other pictures and cast him in this one. In this case, he's currently on Broadway, singing and dancing in Hamilton, <laughs> plays the piano, and as you can see, he's a hell of an actor and, and a decent human being, a nice guy, uh, which is apropos. When, when all of this stuff started hitting the fan a few weeks ago, and, and, and we had this rogues gallery daily coming up. Never once did uh, did I have any anxiety about the, the people in my in my film, uh, which is a, which is a nice feeling. Let me tell you. Well, and I think one of I mean, from my perspective, Steve Carell was a surprise, inspired surprise, surprise for anybody else. Do you, yeah, exactly. Um, as you said, Lawrence Fishburne seems right. Like, who else would that be? Uh, the Washington character, that kid has no fear. He's sitting in a, in a frame with those three guys, and he's hold, not only holding his own, he's moving it. Absolutely. Uh, fearless is a good way to describe it. And uh, uh, when, I, when I first saw him in Pittsburgh, in his, uh, I, I don't know, I feel like a father to this kid. When, when I saw him in Pittsburgh in his uniform, I said, hey, has your mom seen you in that uniform? <laughs> 
He said, yeah, I sent her a picture. His mother lives in Texas. I said, what, what did she say? She cried. <laughs> I think we all cried when the uniforms go on. And you know, the, 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 the Carell character, I'd seen a, an interview with uh, Rick and, and he talked about this and he said, Carell has, has this ability to uh, subtract from the role rather than, than trying to beef it up or add, he, he subtracts. And, and it's absolutely true. Uh, and I'll give you a, a, an example. Early on in the picture, uh, when he's talking about being in the brig, uh, the, the line in the book is Cranston said, oh, uh, he said, how long did you have to serve? He said, well, two years for good behavior. And Cranston said, well, that's not bad. And Carell said, yeah, but you didn't serve it. And, and he said, you know, I think it's too early for him to say something like that. I think maybe he should just say, mm, well, it's pretty bad. You know, which is what he did. And, and he, and he kind of did that throughout, which, uh, which plays right into uh, Linkletter's directing. Uh, you look at uh, the best work of Linkletter, and it's almost counter dramatic. He, um, he does not go for the, uh, the ordinary uh, dramatic moment. He has no arch villains. Uh, you know, when I look at his stuff, and, 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 and I feel this way too, I, uh, I think that the, the, the villain is life itself, and, and, and that's going to vanquish you. You're not going to vanquish it, so the best you can do is try to get it on your side. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, Rick was constantly surprising me uh, with his understating and his avoiding uh, what might be uh, a thing you'd expect in a movie. For instance, I thought when they're talking about the ambush quote uh, and how the kid was killed, I thought, you know, shouldn't we have a cut aside and actually show that, dramatize it? He said, no, he said, to, it, I think it's better just to hear him talk about it. And that's kind of his, uh, his method. And, uh, and I, I, I enjoyed uh, watching him and, and uh, I like what he did. Speaking of method, I would love to hear your method for adapting your own work. What parts of your brain have to work differently from when you're taking, when you're writing the script from your own novel? Well, it's funny because in, in another interview, uh, I was asked how many times have you seen the movie? And I said, well, the first time I saw it, I, I watched it uh, as a novelist. Uh, and uh, the, the, I watched, I, I looked for the selections and then the second time I watched it, I watched it as a screenwriter. And I'm looking at what was missing and what was changed. And I said the third time I watched it, I watched it as a veteran. And, uh, and that's when I cheered up. Um, so to answer your question, uh, it involves a, it involves a, a, a toughness uh, to adapt your own book. It's much easier to adapt someone else's book. And, uh, and another, uh, Frank Pearson was a mentor of mine back in the day. I don't know if you know who he was. And he wrote Dog Day Afternoon and uh, any number of great films. And he said, you know, uh, I'd rather adapt a bad book than a good book. I don't want to feel obliged. And when you write the book yourself, you, you are emotion emotionally invested in it. And it's very, very painful to see it change. But you, you develop that that toughness uh, and economy, and you, you change it, you know, you have to change it. What's more interesting to me than that is, uh, uh, rather than what changes from book to film, or a book to script, what changes from script to film? Because things happen on the set and the rehearsals that you would never suspect, that finally are incorporated into the, uh, into the film. This is the second time that you have written the screenplay, Cinderella Liberty, right? Uh, I've written first. a lot of screenplays, but, but by, adapting the whole book, yeah. Cinderella Liberty and this one. And it, do you see any differences in your, because Cinderella Liberty was a while ago, early 70s, do you see any differences in how you approach the process? Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I just, uh, it, it's so much clearer now. That was the first screenplay I ever did. And I just didn't realize, uh, 
how things work. I didn't, I didn't realize uh, the acting process. I expected the actor to do the lines I wrote. But it doesn't work out that way. Uh, <laughs> actors, actors feel their way through the character. And, uh, and you gotta let them do it. I mean, Cranston, I was holding my breath all the time with him. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can't imagine some of the stuff he did where, where Linklater said, no, no. <laughs> We're not going there uh, because he was, uh, uh, you know, he, he was constantly uh, exploring his character. The other, the other two, as I said, Carell tried to subtract it, uh, and 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 uh, Fishburne was right on the mark. Fishburne did the script. I'd love to hear your voices and your questions. I'm going to open it up right here. I'll repeat the question for you. Okay, the, the role of Cicely, Cicely Tyson plays is really small, but very pivotal to the storyline. I was wondering if you could t talk about how you she was brought to the film. So the question is about the role of Cicely Tyson, which is small, but very pivotal. And how did you bring her to the film? Well, that's, that's another uh, example of uh, interesting things that can happen during the shoot or on the set. Because uh, originally in the script, she is, it was quite a minor character, and by the time we got to the moment, it becomes pivotal. It's the key moment now. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it encapsulates, encapsulates the whole theme mm -hmm. of the picture mm -hmm. is, uh, do you lie? Right. Or do you demand the truth? Yeah. And that's some pretty complex stuff. Uh, and I, uh, when I saw the rough cut, uh, afterwards my wife and I were walking to the car, and uh, wasn't that wasn't that older woman wonderful? He said. I said, yeah. Well, she reminded me of Cecily Tyson. <laughs> and uh, Cece said, no, I don't think that was her. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, it was Cecily Tyson. And uh, she's like 92. Yeah. And uh, she she appeared uh, at the premiere in L.A. and everything. And, and every time she stepped onto a stage, she got a standing ovation. Yeah. Remarkable. Yes, right back there. Can you uh, compare and contrast working with Robert Town and Hal Ashby? Can you compare and contrast working with Robert Town and Hal Ashby, less detail, and working with with Richard Linklater for this film? Very simple. I, I never worked with them. I never worked with them. I knew I knew Robert Town uh, kind of socially, uh, and I never met Hal Ashby until I sat on a panel like this after a screening, uh, because uh, you know, there was no need. And, you know, I was the novelist, so they didn't need me. Yes, right here, go ahead. You mentioned that there were some changes that took place on set from your script, and I'm wondering which among those, and I know some of them surely were painful when they changed your script, but what did you enjoy that changed? So the, the, I'll repeat real quickly for everybody. Uh, the question is about the changes that took place on set in particular, what were the ones you enjoyed? Well, the, the Cecily Tyson moment uh, was, for me, just a, a, a knockout. That was just a home run. Uh, there, there are others uh, uh, right now that are kind of escaping me. But, uh, well, there was, uh, you know, uh, part of Cranston, I, in, in, the, in the script, uh, I think, and in the book, I have Cranston looking at the peach cobbler and saying, aren't you going to eat that? You know, I'll eat that. And he took that as, as, as this guy needs to grab as much as he can. So you'll notice during the movie, he's grabbing the candies, you know. He's, uh, that, that's, he, he, he grabbed that as a characteristic. He, gra he grabs moments, you know. Yeah, okay, it's a sad moment. Uh, a boy has died, but, but we're still alive. You know, let's, let's see if we can get some fun out of this moment. Daryl, were you on set every day? No, I, I, I'm sorry, I was there uh, for a brief time uh, in Pittsburgh. I think the shoot was uh, 30 days, so I guess I did about 10. Perfect. Yes, right here in front. Along those same lines, I wanted to know about the very locker room boys conversation. Branson had some terrific body language. Did that, was that you? No, so, that was him. So, so let's repeat, it's about the locker room dynamic. I and know the one you're talking Cranston about. Cranston had some uh, great body language. It used, to, it used to watch me shave in the morning, is that the one? Well, maybe that was sexual. Huh? 
the sexual stuff was totally, and I'm almost a little embarrassed and glad the audience is behind me. But his body language with the, and the, co yeah. was that your words? No, he that was him. That, 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 that was him. I, I, for me, that was kind of a throwaway joke. Here, if I can remember correctly, here's the line. They're talking about growing old. And he said, I miss the days when, they said, you know, he used to he used to stand up and watch me shave, now it watches me pull up my socks. That was it. That was, that was a throwaway joke. Well, he, he wanted to do a half hour on that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, you couldn't stop him. And, and that's, you know, so as as the as the author and the screenwriter, when I see this, I kind of cringe. And I think, oh, Jesus, but Ultimately, I thought I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust his energy. It's not like me. Nothing at all like me. I'm going to trust Rick. Uh, I've liked his movies, and I'm just going to see where it goes. Well, that kind of thing made comedy come to life. But I would not classify this as a comedy. But that kind yeah. of that was pretty well, funny stuff. I will tell you. I will tell you one thing that does bother me still. Uh, and I wish I had had some influence on it, but I wasn't there at the time. When that colonel uh, goes off on the kid and starts talking about the graduation suit and uses that language, no colonel would talk to uh, uh, a Marine that way. And 